Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the first of the Photon series of my 6502 assembly program tutorials. What's Photon? Well, it's the little game you can see here. Basically, it's a little Tron clone, and um, it's essentially a tutorial on uh, simple game writing, and also, um, more importantly, I think for this series, is about how to plot pixels in a multi-platform way in a lot of different systems, including in a lot of cases systems that aren't bitmap based systems. The, the BBC you can see here is definitely bitmap based, but the Super Nintendo is not. This is a tile sprite based system and we've um, simulated a pixel display. As I say, I thought this would be just interesting to have a look at as a different way of using a tile sprite based system and making a game that works on a lot of different systems in the same way. It's 99% um, the same code you're seeing run on both of these systems. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Now today uh, we're going to be going over the um, data definitions of the 6502 version of the game. They're basically the same as the other versions though. And this is just going to be a way of me discussing an introduction to this game if you've not heard of it before. Um, because if you look at the data definitions, you start to understand how the structures of the game work. Now that said, I'm not going to cover the multi-platform code for the 6502 version because it's basically identical to the Z80 version. Um, it, I ported it, I used some scripts to help convert it. The um, label names are the same, the, the symbol definitions are the same, the data variables are the same, and the structure of the code is as similar as it can be. So if you go and take a look at the Z80 series, lessons two to five, I think it is, uh, they cover the multi-platform code and I don't really want to make four episodes that are identical to those. So it's just going to be this quick introduction episode today where we go over the basic workings of it if you've not heard of this game before and if you want to know the details of the multi-platform sections, see the Z80 series and just uh, you know, maybe read along this 6502 code as you go. And then we're going to come back to the 6502 for the other Photon episodes, which are the platform specific ones, where we look at each system and what it takes to get the pixel plotting routines working on those, in some cases, dirty, dirty tricks like on the NES, which is uh, has a lot of challenges for that one. So it should be quite interesting and um, I think it could be quite um, useful to you if you're looking to do things a bit unusual, like um, vector based routines, for example. Anyway, let's go over to the code and let's have a look. So here's the Super Nintendo version, here's the BBC version and so on. Uh, we're not going to be looking at those today though, the, so this is the platform specific stuff. What we're going to do is we're going to go over the RAM definitions and the data definitions. We'll have a discussion a little bit about the vectors as well because I think that's important. Um, the game, if you go back to the title screen here, everything's drawn with vectors and pixels and lines and things. There's no, um, there's no bitmap based graphics at all. So there we go. Okay, so first of all, um, all of the coordinates, well, they're all done in 16 bits, and this is to support the systems with a 320 pixel wide screen. A lot only have 256, some don't, so it's a lot of 16 bit definitions here, and that's why our X and Y coordinates are here, and they're two bytes each. Now, we also have a, a 16 bit acceleration, and that's so that we can just add the acceleration to the current position to get the new position, so that's what, that's what we've got there. That's the player ones there. We've got the player direction as well. The turns are in 90 degree increments, so there's only four possible options, and which one of those is selected is, is put here, and we'll see the code that helps turn things around later on. CPU's basically the same here. We've got the current direction and also the turn, and that's used by the AI. So the AI will occasionally just sort of flip whether it's turning counterclockwise or clockwise. And um, but by default, it will continue turning in the last way direction it turns so that it will move smoothly, but a bit of unpredictability as well. We've got a key timeout. Um, when you hold down a turn key, you only turn once and that's so you don't end up crashing into yourself. So that's used to detect whether the key has been released yet. Best level is sort of a high score. The game doesn't have a high score, but it will remember what level is the best one you've got to. AI is the intelligence of the computer. It's basically a look ahead level. If the AI is set to seven, it will look seven pixels ahead and that's what it will respond to. So a higher number basically means the computer is responding very early. And if anything gets in, in before that, it will miss it and crash into it. So the higher is more stupid in this case and lower is more intelligent, which is possibly backwards, but that's the way it is. Lives is player lives, pretty simple there. The tick is the current game tick. It's either basically one or zero, and this is to do with the boost mode where you move twice as fast with every tick rather than every other tick. Here's boost mode, one will be disabled and zero will be enabled. Here's boost power, that's how much boost power the player's got left. It's shown in the bottom corner and it goes down. Um, actually, it's doubled, so a value of 200 in the counter will be shown as 100 on screen just because of the 0 to 99 limit. So that's why we've got a shown boost power to remember what's actually been shown to the screen and so we know when to update the boost power. 
a random seed, random number generator. It's the same random number generator as Y question. So it's exactly the same. And then we've got some variables for our line drawing routine. Um, it's not the most efficient line drawing routine, but it does work. It's one I wrote myself. Um, basically, it works in 24 bit. So um, that's so that we can do a coordinates of 0 to 320. And um, we need to be able to do fractions because we might need to move one pixel horizontally and half a pixel vertically. Or um, arguably, you would say, well, we're, we're moving one vertical pixel every two horizontal pixels, but I'm doing it in fractions in this case. So that's why we're doing it there. Now I know there's more efficient routines. Uh, I, I, I know that I didn't have one at this time, but I have got one for a tutorial we'll be doing later on. So as I say, I'm not claiming this is the best in the world. I kind of work this out in my own head. Where's the new one I've got? I got off Wikipedia. I enjoy trying to figure things out myself. It makes me feel like I've got a little bit more intelligent and less stupid. So um, I do try and do that. And then we've got scale and line color. And um, this is the line drawing routines can actually scale themselves. And this is how the vectors will be scaled up and down for the different screen sizes. The vectors, while they're slow, they were very convenient. Now, you'll notice all of these are defined as relative offsets to something called user RAM. And if you've seen my YQuest series, you might know why. Um, this is so that we can support systems um, irrespective of what their capabilities are. Some systems um, will be loading this game into RAM and you would just have a block of data with a DS definition. And that's where we would store these. But other systems are cartridge-based systems and they can't do that. So we would need to have our game running in ROM and we'd need to point to an area of RAM and say, hey, use this for your variables. And that's why all of these are relative offsets. That's why I do it that way. So that's the definitions. And there's not many for this game. The game's very simple. There's nothing like um, YQuest. You had lots of enemies that all had their own data. This one, there's just one enemy. So a lot more simple. And here's the data definitions. Now, I said before that the player would turn in 90 degree increments. And these are the four directions. There's two words each. And that's because these are the new accelerations depending on the player direction. So the player's direction will be multiplied up and will be a pair of words that will be read in here. And they will be set to the new acceleration. Here's some random number generation tables. It's exactly the same as YQuest. So um, they're just used to help with the random generation. And here's a back backup of the settings. Now, what are these? Well, these are basically copied over the top of these, I think possibly even these. And this is to initialize a new game so that the enemy and the player are both starting in the right positions and moving in the right direction. So it's just an, an easy way of setting everything up so that the game is ready for a new level. And we've got some text strings here, 255 termination, as I always use. So um, same format as my simple series used. And here we've got a couple of objects. Now, these are the um, obstacles that you saw in the game level when the game started. Um, I'll just show you again. These are basically these things here. You can see them here, or at least one of them. These are blocks with an X in them. But there is a second more um, tricky obstacle as well. It's basically a kind of set of brackets with an empty part in the middle. Now, these are defined as a set of movements and um, lines. Um, we will go to another file to just quickly discuss these. Here we go. Now, there's two formats that my game uses for its vector graphics. There's one which is known as the packet format, and I did not invent this. This is the um, format used by the Vectrex, the 6809 console, which I'm covering in my other series. So um, I thought I was playing around with the Vectrex while I was writing this game, totally unrelated. And I was um, playing with this packet format, and I added a simple drawing routine to uh, Aquasprite Editor to draw the graphics, and I thought, Actually, this would be quite handy for um, for Photon. I could I could maybe make the title screen with this, and so I wrote a, an interpreter for the same format, and that's what we've got here. Um, a zero command byte defines a movement, and then there's a relative movement from the current drawing cursor position. An FF is a line, and then there's a relative destination for the line from the current position. A zero one is an end of the packet. So that's the format. Now each line of this uses three bytes and the X and Y coordinates are an 8-bit signed byte. OK, now that's very good. There's no problem with that. But my only concern was that that's three bytes per movement. And um, when I was going to do the font and things, it felt like that was a bit more excessive than I needed, maybe. And I started thinking and I thought, well, hey, uh, I, can, um, I can maybe shrink this down. You know, rather than using 8 bits for the X and Y coordinates, I could just use seven and that would save me two bits. And there's only three possible commands, line, move and end. Uh, so, you know, I don't need uh, any, I don't need that many bits. So that's what I've done here. So now we've got our seven bit Y, our seven bit X, and we've got two command bits here. And if both are zero, it's going to be a move. 
If the first one is 0 and the second one is 1, then it's going to be a line. And if they're both 1, then it is the last line within the command. So basically that is saying end of command there. And um, that gives a lower resolution for the movements, but it saves a byte and it works very nicely. So that's what I call the compressed packet format because it uses two bytes instead of three. And that's what I use for all my graphics. Very good. And there we go. So um, that's actually all we're going to be covering today. As I say, the, the rest of the code is basically in the multi-platform section and also in the um, vector drawing routines. And um, they've been converted partially by scripts and partially manually from the Z80 version. But the structure and the names of the labels and things is all identical. And I really um, don't have the willpower to repeat four entire lessons of content which would literally be saying things I've already said before. So um, I'd recommend you go and take a look at the Z80 series um, just to see what, what how the functionality works. And as I say, assuming you know what 6502 is and you look at my source code, you should understand what's going on because as I say, the functionality is the same. It's just the commands are different from the Z81. Um, and anyway, we're going to be coming back to Photon very soon and we're going to start by looking at the BBC, the BBC version of the game. Um, and then we'll be looking at all the other 6502 versions as well. So it should be a lot of fun. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. As I always say, you, know, you can go to my website and you can download the source code and you can have fun with it and do whatever you want. Um, if you've liked it, please like and subscribe. If you like the videos, YouTube recommends them to more people and that keeps my motivation going to keep making these games and doing all of these videos because it takes a lot of time. But whatever you do, I hope you'll enjoy seeing this series and I hope it'll give you some enthusiasm and ideas for your programming. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video today, please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job. And it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue Justify doing it, essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video. You can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon. It's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you would like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.